morning, everybody. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Yeah. We're glad each one of you are here, and we're thankful for what God is doing, and we're looking forward to a good time in Him. It is Super Sunday, as they call it, but uh, I'm thankful that we're able to be in the house of the Lord, and this is truly a Super Sunday when God's Spirit visits with us, and that's what we're praying for today. That's what we're looking forward to. We're going to open with prayer, and maybe you have uh, needs on your heart you'd like to make known by an upraised hand. And I know there's so many. We're going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to stand giving the honor to the Lord as we bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for how you've blessed us, Lord. We pray that you would uh, continue to lead and guide and direct us. For each hand that was raised today, Father, we pray that you would just go to the point of each need. We don't know each one, but we're so thankful that you know each and every detail more than we could ever even understand. We pray that you would be with those that aren't able to be with us today due to sickness or uh, for other various reasons. We pray you just uh, protect them and give them a healing touch. Lord, we pray you'd be with this service, that everything that's said and done it would be to your honor, your glory, and will not fail to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm thankful that if we accept Jesus, we can be redeemed. Let's sing this old hymn of the church, I'm Redeemed. Perfect love casts out all fear, 1 John 4, 18. And this is our 
theme song for our series, The Loves. Fear doesn't stand a chance when we're in the love of Jesus. Exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praise. I'm so glad to be my eyes. So glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth. You came from all the way from the earth to the cross. I did it from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the Lord, I live in your name on My death to 
From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we lift him up today, and I'm thankful for that. I'm going to ask, actually, Adley, I'm going to ask Brother Carl to come. He's going to have a special, and then you're going to sing. Okay. If you could just step down here. That was my fault, not hers. <laughs> Brother Carl said they saved the best for last, Adley. So. We're thankful to have Brother Carl uh, singing this morning. He. It's a busy time of year for him, but we're glad he, the Lord laid this song on his heart. I could help either, so what must I do? But one coat was ugly and terribly torn, the other, a new one, had never. Tell you the best thing I ever did do. I laid off that old coat and put on the new. The old coat was ugly and not fit to wear. I thought of man was earthly and made on the ground. We all bore his image the whole world around. The next was my Savior from heaven so He gave me this new coat, you now see me wear. I'll tell you the best thing I ever did do. I 
laid off the old coats and put on the new. Now this cold it fits me and keeps me so warm. It's good in the winter. It's good in the Savior has dressed me in garments so right. He fills me with glory, his image I'll bear. I'll tell you the best thing I ever did do. I laid off that old coat and put on the new. Have you ever felt like nobody was left? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach, reach out your hand. And oh, Someone will come running, and I know they'll take you home. Even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, and when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. So let the sun come streaming in, because you'll reach up and you'll rise again. Lift your head and look around. You will be found. You will be found. You will be found. There's a place where we don't have to feel alone And every time that you call out, you're a little less alone If you only say the words From across the silence, your voice is heard And oh, someone will Dark comes crashing through 
when you need a friend to carry you and when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again to lift your head and the ground you will be found you shadows morning is breaking it all into all into it's filling up the empty and suddenly I see that all is new all is new you are not alone you are not dark comes crashing through when you need someone to carry you and you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and you'll rise again lift your head and look around you will be found you say amen. It's already been good to be in the house of the Lord and we're so thankful for what God is doing and uh, we are going to continue in our series loves as defined in the Bible and you know many of you I guess you'd have to kind of be living under a rock in this country not to know that it is Super Sunday or Super Bowl Sunday. Now um, I have to tell you that when it comes to the NFL, I root for a couple different teams. Um, and they all have significance in my life, so that's kind of why I root for them. Uh, I grew up in uh, not far from Washington, D.C., so uh, I was by birth a uh, Washington fan, and um, my dad rooted for them. And I remember the only time the only time that we were ever allowed um, to miss a Sunday night service, and they ended up canceling it anyway, was when the Washington football team went to the Super Bowl with Coach Joe Gibbs. And that was a big memory, and I rooted for them. Then when I moved to Louisiana, uh, they wouldn't let me move there unless I told them that I would root for the Saints. I said yes, and uh, I kind of became a little favored because of that, and that's the reason I have this uh, tie on today. This is my uh, New Orleans Saints Super Bowl tie. Uh, they had not won the Super Bowl, and I can't remember how many years, and... Um, the first year that I moved there, they won. And we rooted for them all the time we were there. In fact, it was the New Orleans Saints that really got me to become one of the football fans that I used to laugh at. <laughs> I used to see people get so upset. I used to see people get so animated, and that was not me. But I remember watching the Saints game and I had a, a couch in my house that was very special. It was from another nation donation. It was, um, I think, manufactured in 1971. It was striped with orange, green, 
and some other 70s color that I can't remember right now. I've tried to block it out of my memory. However, as I was watching the Saints on TV, floor model, yeah, that was donated too. I sat down watching the game. I'd come home from church. We had Subway right next to us. I got my Subway sandwich. I'm going to watch the game. I've got my Saints shirt on. I'm ready. And they play horribly. Now, I just sit there. But all of a sudden, they start to come back. And something happens in me. I just stood up. My sandwich went out the back and on the floor. I took a pillow from the, that 1970s couch and threw it. Hit the TV and hollered and jumped. Now you know that I'm built for comfort, not speed. And for me to holler and jump was a big deal. So being a little embarrassed, but it was just me in my little house, I kept on, so much so that my voice kind of got hoarse. Well, the next time we had church, I went to some dear friends of mine that went to church with us, and he was a huge Saints fan, and I went, Rodney, you won't believe what I did. What'd you do? I relayed the story. Rodney, a big, big man, reached out and hugged me and said, Now, you're a saint. What do you mean? Because you're acting like a saint fan. Well, you see, when we get saved and we say yes to Jesus, the Bible doesn't call us saved sinners. It calls us saints. Now, there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm not a saint. I, I can't live up to that. You're right. You're absolutely right. But the Bible does not tell us that we have to live up to it. Amen. I'm thankful for that because I couldn't do it. What's wonderful is the Spirit of God, the same spiritual DNA that was in Jesus Christ, is now living in us, and it empowers us to live like a saint. Amen. And a saint has the love of God in them. And last week we talked about familial love, and when we become saved and we say yes to Jesus, it doesn't matter the name over the door, but if you love Jesus and I love Jesus, then we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and in the words of that great 70s song, we are family. Right. And this concept, because when we say love in our culture, it can mean a whole lot of things, can it? I had a friend some years ago that uh, she just loved everything. She loved your hair color. She loved your coat. She loved your dog. She loved that uh, coffee you're drinking because it's her favorite too. She just loved everything. She just used that word. And then uh, I remember her telling uh, her intended that she loved him. And he goes, really? Because she had used the word so flippantly that it lost some meaning, right? But in biblical language, in in the New Testament that was translated from Greek, uh, from Aramaic into Greek, the Greeks have four words for our word love. There are four different concepts. The first one we talked about was familial love, that love that you have for your family members. And it's not a, one of those things where I love them because I have to. It's not one of those things where I love them but I don't like them. It's not one of those, I'll cry at their funeral, but I don't want to go out to eat with them kind of love. It is a all-in kind of love because it's born. And when we're born again, being accepted Jesus into our life, and he cleanses us of our sin, we're born again. We have spirit, new spiritual DNA, and we have a new family. We used this verse last week, and we're going to use it again today because it's 
the same concept. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. That with brotherly love there is the Greek word philostogos. The first part, phile, the last part, storgos. Storgos means family or familiar love. What this does is it joins the other type of love that we're going to talk about today. Phile or phileo love, which is um, brotherly love. Friendship, just like the state of, or the city of Philadelphia, they call it the city of brotherly love. There's a church in Revelation, uh, the church of Philadelphia, which is the church of brotherly love. As we look at this today, if we are believers, if we have a new spiritual DNA, if we've said yes to Jesus and no to our old life, we've allowed him to change our life, and we are working toward being more like him and less like us, meaning that we say yes to him every day, we do the things he wants us to do, and we work and on our end to do what he has called us to do. That doesn't mean we do it on our own. It just means that we endeavor to be what God has called us to be. But we're also human, so sometimes we don't hit that mark all the way. Amen. Sometimes we may have a, an addiction issue or a hang-up or a problem that God has not delivered us from right away. But when we surrender to him fully, he works with us till he can fully deliver us. I'm thankful for that because I believe with all my heart that God still delivers today. God still heals today. God still transforms today. I believe that. And here's the beautiful thing about that truth. The Bible says that God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he cannot lie, and his word is true. So whether I believe it or not, it's still true for you and for me. But be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. This is a not just a brotherly or a familiar type of love. This is a friendship. Now, in our wor world today, in our culture, we have a hard time um, being friends. You know why that is? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. Because we've romanticized everything. And in a culture where we've romanticized everything and we've kind of done away with uh, that it's just a male-female romantic relationship and we've kind of opened the door, then if you have a friend, well, something else must be going on. And that's prevalent. In fact, so much so that I just saw, I didn't know this was a thing. But one of my former college students was telling another one of our former college students, happy birthday, and they are best friends. They're, they've been friends for years. And I hope I got it right. I should have wrote it down. Happy birthday to my non-romantic heterosexual life partner. Happy birthday, good buddy. Come on. I mean, what happened to that? Because in our culture today, even friendship is being, the rug's being pulled out. I just read this not too long ago. Did you know that some school programs, and I didn't read the whole article, and I probably should have, but they are, they are now taking out the song from Toy Story, uh, You Got a Friend in Me. Because that puts too much pressure on the children. Wow. I don't understand. But they're doing away with friendship now. But the bi And if you notice this, pay close attention. Everything they're trying to subvert or get rid of is all biblical principles that God has based 
society on. Not only that, it's the principles that should separate the church from the world. They're trying to come under attack of those things. Did you know now they are saying that David and Jonathan in Scripture, they had a close Philae Storgos kind of love. They were brotherly love. They were friends. They're now saying that that had to be some kind of uh, homosexual relationship. Wrong. Eh. You can read it in the Hebrew. You can read it in the Greek. You can read it backwards, sideways, and upside down. There's no way you can press that to make that fit. We are to have friends that love like brothers. And the Bible says to have friends, we must find ourselves friendly. And that comes from that phileo kind of love that, especially in the church, the church is a unique organism where people from all different walks, all different stages of life can get along and work together because they have one thing in common. They have one thing in common, and that's Jesus Christ. That Jesus is their hope, their source, their savior. And that if we can agree on that, we should be able to get along and love each other. Today is Team Sunday, and many of you wore your different teams. And there's all kinds of team colors around here. But because we don't all root for the same worldly team, we, if we love Jesus, we're all on the same team. And I'm thankful for that. I may not even like the team you root for. You may not like the team I root for. But it doesn't matter because if we love Jesus, we can get along. We can tease each other about it. Sure, it's all in good fun. But we should prefer one another and be friendly to one another. What's that kind of friendship look like? What's that kind of love, that phileo love look like? I'm glad you asked. 1 Peter 1, 22, 21 and 22 says, Who by him did believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls, obeying in the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. You love them fervently. What's that mean? Strongly. You love them with a pure heart. There's no ulterior motive. So here's some practical things. The kind of friendship love, it looks like what, what Paul told the church at Galatia, see, they were being shifted all different ways. They were, people were telling them to believe this, and they would. They were kind of gullible. But he was trying to tell them how to behave and remind them of whose they were. They were, they were God's. They, were, they loved the Lord, and Jesus was their Savior. He was reminding them that, and then he reminds them toward the end of the letter, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. That phileo kind of love is the kind of love that's not superficial. It's the kind that looks out for each other. It's the kind that if I see uh, a brother going down the wrong path, going, come here, wait a minute, don't go that way. Now, you know, I've noticed that you've been kind of laying out over here and you've been, I've noticed you hanging out with this crew over here, and I'm not saying they're bad people, but they got a reputation, and you know the Bible says uh, bad company corrupts good morals, so you might want to pay attention to who you hang with. See, and if somebody gets overtaken in a fault, what's that mean? It means they make a mistake. It means they might even fall into a sin. They might even uh, over, get overcome by a fault that they have. They might not just use their temper. They may lose their temper. And then it becomes sinful, right? So what do we do? Those of you that are spiritual, those of you that have this phileo kind of love, what do you do? Well, you know, if they were just closer to the Lord, they wouldn't have that problem. Okay. Or, I told them they shouldn't have done that. If they'd have listened to me, or if you'd have listened to me, no. 
Come here. I saw you go off on homeboy over there. You all right? Okay. Now, let's talk about this thing. And we restore them. We don't label them forever. Oh, watch them. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh, they can't do this because 10 years ago they lost their temper on somebody. So, you know, we can't have them doing this. What? Those are spiritual. Restore them. Now, if we're talking about serious, sinful things, there are restoration processes, and we should do that. Amen? Oh, Brother Brian, what about this and that? Well, this is not the place to discuss every scenario. If you've got a question, come to me personally, and we'll discuss it. But a kind of love should be a restorative love. Not a blind love that we just turn our back. Well, that's just how they is. No. We help them because we know that's not how they need to be, but God has better for them. Amen? Okay. But exhort one another daily. Wait a minute. Did I read that right? Because sometimes we, we read that like, but exhort one another just on Sunday. Exhort one another when we feel like it. Now this is Hebrews. Now this was the church at Hebrews where the writer, the writer to the Hebrew people, they were ready to give up. They were ready to throw in the towel. And this is what he says. As a member of this church, as a body of this, uh, as a part of this body of believers, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How you doing today? Oh, you don't feel good? I'm sorry you don't feel good. I'm going to pray for you. But God's give us another day. It's a great day to be alive. If you're me, you probably start singing a Travis Tritt song. But let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now, nobody in here but people I know, they take that verse, Christian people now, and they, they read it, but they practice it cut off. They read it and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. But they practice it a lot of times like this. And let us consider one another to provoke. We're just going to provoke them. Because they didn't do it the way I wanted it done. No. Provoke them to what? Love and good works. Provoke them to do good things for the furtherance of the kingdom we should all be doing that not criticizing oh there's constructive criticism and there's a time and a place for that amen and if we love each other enough the time and a place for that might be going out to coffee just you and them going you know you do a wonderful job up there but I've noticed that A, B, and C I'm going to give you a little, this is for free, this has nothing to do with anything else, but um, if you're going to uh, criticize somebody, don't criticize them publicly when you can do it privately to them and to help them get better. Also, don't criticize something you're not willing to jump in and help yourself. That's the end period I put into that. That, I'm sorry, I went from preaching to meddling, and I didn't even warn you. I'm, I'm sorry. And then this kind of friendship, love, confess your faults one to another, oh boy, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5, 16. We... Pray for one another. We confess our faults one another. Oh, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know, we church of God, we don't, we don't confess no faults because, you know, we live in holy and we saints and everything. And so we, no. When we as believers become open to one another and then we can trust each other to pray for one another, did you know God will begin to grow us and therefore grow this body of believers because he sees good fruit here and he wants people to come in and get it too. 
Now, I don't want you to think that this sermon is a sermon of condemnation because I believe in a lot of these areas we got it right. I'm thankful for that. I just know for me we can do a little better, right? I know I can, and you probably can too. And I'm thankful for the truth of God's word that reminds us so that we exhort one another. We pray for one another. We lift up one another if they're caught in a fault. And we confess our faults one to another. And you know when we confess our faults one to another, then if my fault is I'm not real, if I say I'm not real organized, then if we're going to do a project together for the church, you know that Brother Brian is not the one to organize it. It's just not his thing. Does that make sense? Now, I can't organize. I'm just using that as an example. But, you know, when we confess that, if we don't know that, we just throw somebody in there, and then we have a, te- well, people I know, have a tendency to get mad when they, the people don't live up to their expectations. But if we would just tell somebody, look here, uh, that ain't my, my thing. Or maybe we don't know it's our thing. I'm thankful for a church that I grew up in that um, they didn't really, they did a lot of things right, did a few things wrong, but the one thing they did was they decided that Brian was good with working with people, and they were just going to let me work with all different age groups until I found the one that worked. Well, I knew, I, I, let me tell you one that I, it was not my gift. They threw me in the kindergarten, first and second grade, all together. with a Bible, patted me on the back and said, good luck. Now that's not right. By the end of that first day, I was like, I don't know about this here. Next class, I was like, well, I came prepared. I did. I brought a rope. (laughs) Not for what you're thinking. And I had a lesson all prepared. I had puppet. I mean, I had the whole ball of wax. We got the rope. They all held onto the rope, and we had bathroom time. And I learned all this stuff, but I realized this is not my thing. I'd rather work with teenagers. They're self-cleaning. So I realized that, and I went to my pastor, and I said, this ain't my gig. I can't. I'm sorry, I don't mean to let you down. And I felt bad because I felt like I was letting the Lord down. And sometimes we can feel that way. I'm like, but I just don't feel like this is my gift and I'm afraid if I keep on this, it's not going to be good for these kids. But that was a fault because I'm not perfect, right? He said, okay, no problem. We'll move you up. Praise the Lord. Move me to middle school. I was so happy. I mean, I can deal with I couldn't deal with little kindergartners having to go to the bathroom every five minutes and all that. I couldn't hang with that. But teenage, but, can, but middle school kids, the boys that can't remember to bathe and the girls that, that uh, don't know who they are and what they're, where they're going the next minute, I can handle them. I was in my element. Then they moved me again. And through that, it built character. But if I wouldn't have been open and honest and said, well, I can just do it. And, and we've all seen instances where people have been put in positions because they're just trying to fill a hole because there's nobody else to do it. That's when you pray, Lord, I know I'm not the best person. Send somebody else that's better or make me better. There you go. That's brotherly love. And if we see somebody struggling, be like, how can I help you? How can I help you? How can I, how can I do this so that we... We can do this better. How can I love you as a friend better? How can I do this better? Because when we lift each other up, when we pray for each other, when we exhort each other, so much better we will be. And so much better we look to the outside world as well. That they see this is a group of people that love each other, that that push each other on. This being Super Bowl Sunday, you know, do you, does anybody know, and I'm sure I've got 
probably some over in this area that do. Does anybody know the, uh, the last ranked team in the NFL for this season? Anybody know who the last ranked team is? Yeah. The Bears, right. Um, do you know that uh, they have been last ranked for, for several seasons, not consecutively, but uh, they are not the best team in the world. They used to be really good. In fact, Saturday Night Live even did a skit, the Bears, you know, and, and, and they were a big thing. But somewhere around, uh, I believe it was 92, maybe even earlier than that, they got rid of a very important part of their team. When the owner died and his daughter took over, she got rid of the Honey Bears. The Honey Bears were their cheerleading squad. And now they've not had a real good winning season since then. And many people in Chicago call it the Honey Bear Curse. You didn't know you'd learn that today, did you? So that got me to thinking cheerleaders are important. Cheerleaders are important. Now, we're not here to get into the debate of cheerleading's not a sport. Uh, if you've ever watched them, it is. They get hurt. Let me tell you something. I can tell you they do because we were in drama when I was in high school, and some of the cheerleaders, and, and uh, we had a female cheerleading coach and a male cheerleading coach, and they came in to help us to learn some pratfalls for drama. And that big cheerleading coach picked me up and said, if you don't think it's fake, whoop, <laughs> threw me in the air, I hit the crash mat, boom, and it hurt. So, cheerleaders are important. Why? Because a good cheerleader stands on the sideline and their job is to lift up, to encourage the team, and to keep them going no matter how bad they look on the field. Oh, let me tell you something. When I went to high school, we had a little school and, and, and our football team was bad. I mean, not bad like Michael Jackson, good, but bad, awful. And them little cheerleaders would come out there, and I'm telling you what, I, a couple, I called a couple of the games, and, and I'd be up in the announcer booth, and them boys would be drugged through the mud, and them cheerleaders would come hopping out there like they just won a million dollars, and they'd be like, come on, Cougars, you can do it. Put a little power to it. Go, go, go. And them old boys would get shaking. Woo! And our cheerleaders could tear up a crowd, now I'm telling you. They'd get up in the stands and stomp. Now our record was like 0 oh, and 42. But them cheerleaders, you'd never know it looking at them. Come on, Cougars, you can do it. Put a little power to it. Let's go. And they'd stomp on them bleachers and everybody go rawr like a cougar. And it was awesome. It didn't matter how bad the team got. Them girls kept cheering. And then we got a couple big old butch guys like that looked like brick walls with teeth and they was tossing them girls up in the air. And it was crazy. Come on, Cougars. Whoop, whoop. And they're throwing them up in the air, tossing batons. It was a spectacle, friends. Now let me tell you something. All my high school career, we didn't win many football games. But our cheerleaders went to state every year. <laughs> Showed me something. Them cheerleaders were important. And as God's people, he calls us to be cheerleaders for one another. It doesn't matter how bad it may look outside. It doesn't matter how hard the enemy is fighting, but we stand on the sidelines because guess what we already know who's going to win we are but we cheer them on come on saint you can do it let god's power put you to it come on saint you can do it don't kick them while they're down but lift them up lift them up if they're caught in a fault love them 
Amen. He may be watching today. And you may be looking and going, that preacher is crazy. <laughs> but the second thing you might be thinking is, I want that. You may not have a home church. We encourage you to get into a Bible teaching, Bible believing church. If you're close to here, you're welcome. But most importantly, it's about a relationship with Jesus. All you have to do is say yes to him. Repent, meaning turn away from your sin. Ask him to come into your life, and he will change you. May God bless you.